Our talk today is titled Building a Green and Sustainable Singapore. So as all of you know, now there's this uh, whole talk about how Singapore can be more sustainable, can be more green. Um, you know, that there's this whole Singapore Green Plan, right? Uh, 2030, which was announced during the budget uh, just a few months ago. So today we really want to listen to our expert opinion, right, uh, Mr. Manwei and uh, of course Mr. Sui Yong. So without further ado, I, I'd like to um, give, uh, I, I'd like to start on uh, the questions. So uh, for those of you who do not know, um, Singapore is going very much into uh, sustainability, uh, like I mentioned just now earlier in the talk. And this is done both on uh, the ground level, which, uh, you know, can be done by both corporates and individuals, and also by the government in terms of uh, how we build, you know, our buildings sustainably and, and vertical farming, which are, which are some of the things that I, I think we should discuss about later. So for the first question, uh, I, I think it's uh, good to address to Manwei because he's after all, the founder of Sustainable SG, which, you know, it, it's, it's pretty much the title of our talk today. So, Manwe, what, why does sustainability matter to us as residents in Singapore? Would you like to share it to everybody? Um, yeah, sure, sure Ter Terence. Um, I, I mean, in a way, I like uh, early on when I kind of self-introduced, I kind of touched a bit about what sustainability is. So, it's really kind of uh, making sure, right, that uh, the future for our kids and their kids will be just as good as uh, it has been for us, right? So, and then, and, uh, and of course, the, the, the focus on of sustainability has very much, especially in recent uh, months and years, has been very much on the uh, environmental side. But I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Suyong in his introduction also kind of touched on some of the other aspects, right? In terms of what makes a good society is really making sure that we, we carry with us, uh, you know, our cousins and, and, and friends and relatives who are really, they need a bit more, they need a lot of help, right? So, so there's certainly that social uh, part to it. Yeah. So, so in other words, um, and I, I think it's important, right? Because um, if you think about it, I mean, I don't think we want to live in a world where the, the physical environment is very harsh. Right, say in terms of you know really extreme weather, uh, in terms of really hot days, uh, and um, and of course here in Singapore we feel we are quite fortunate, right? Because we stay in a re relatively safe environment. But really, if you look beyond, right? So you look at say some of the droughts, famines, and so on. So they are really impacting many of the poorer communities around the world, right? Yeah. Okay, so I would like to add on here to expand. Let's let's expand the sustainable definition to not just environment. So carrying on the point about making sure that there's enough for our next generation as well as their next generation. Mm. Sustainable is making sure that we are not exploiting resources today such that there isn't enough for our poorer friends and relatives that we don't over-exploit such that there is also sufficient for our children and grandchildren to live a normal, comfortable life. So it could be seen in terms of, for example, public housing. We start to buy and we stretch our last dollar to buy something, push the prices up, and then policies themselves don't keep uh, prices affordable, but incomes are not catching up and then that becomes not sustainable. So sustainability doesn't have to be confined to just the environment or making sure that uh, we don't use plastic straws and throw them away too much. It could be also sustainability in terms of, of uh, social sustainability, making sure that our next generation will be comfortable. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. So in other words, there's an element of uh, it of uh, equality, right? In sustainability in that you want societies to kind of treat different segments uh, fairly, right? And, and there's also kind of a time-based uh, equality element, right? Which is that we want future generations to have the same access to resources as we enjoy now. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's why I, I think it's important, right? I mean, it's really with that in mind, uh, because we don't have a situation where we kind of draw down or deplete uh, resources now such that 
it really cripples uh, future generations to come. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you. And you know now um, everybody thinks that oh uh, sustainability th this whole big topic is actually something that the youth really enjoy or or, or they are really passionate about. But what do you think about the responsibility of, um, you know, maybe the more senior citizens and, you know, what, what can they do on a more personal basis or um, in, in order to push this initiative for the country as well? Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, first, um, it's understandable why the, the young will feel more kind of uh, interested and motivated, right? I, I, I would say it's for two reasons. One is that uh, they are... Um, they, they are kind of more influenced by what's in the media. So then, of course, they also have kind of, uh, in a way, role models like Greta Thunberg, right? So, so that's one. So they are, they are more exposed. And second thing is that you think about it, they'll be the ones who will be impacted a lot more, right? So because uh, for us, uh, particularly the older ones, um, we have really enjoyed uh, a lot of good things in the past, whereas in, is the, at least as, as far as the environmental side and arguably the social uh, aspects of sustainability as well. I think it's really, you'll impact the youth for many more decades to come. So in that sense, they have more uh, skin in the game, right? So, but by having said that, I, I really think that is, I mean, all of us are in it together, right? So, and uh, I think that coming back to Terence's question, so I, I would say that what, what can we all do? So I would say one is to find out more, right? So, um, I mean, read about it, uh, talk to friends, right? Go online. So there are really a lot of excellent uh, videos that are available. So in fact, uh, you can go to this website called drawdown.org. So it's actually, um, it's an NGO headquartered in the, in the US. So what they do is that they actually produce a lot of, uh, they've articulated what are the science-based solutions to climate change, right? And then if you go to their website, you can actually see a lot of very interesting videos that tell you a lot more about what the issues are, right? And these are very objective, well-produced content. Yeah. So again, to add on for the younger generation, because yes, for them, the next 50 or 70 years of their lives, they might be feeling the negative repercussions more than us because yeah. my runway is only much shorter than theirs, right? But for, for the older generation, I mean, I, I think that they have in fact started off, especially for Singapore's pioneer generation and then Madeka generation, they, I thought they have started off with this concept of being frugal. Once you are frugal, you only buy generally what you need and maybe just a little bit more as a buffer. You don't buy 20 shirts of 20 colors uh, from Giordano, for example. And so you don't overconsume. And so our parents and grandparents' generations, they, they probably didn't have the same green concepts as what we are talking about now, but their lifestyles were not sort of so lavish that they are over-consuming and then causing harm to the earth. Yes. Okay, absolutely. I, I mean, um, I, I would say that the science has said very clearly uh, that uh, environmental impact uh, I, uh, equals to population times affluence times technology, right? So of which uh, population and uh, consumption uh, are really the two main drivers behind a lot of the environmental damage that's being done. And I, I totally agree with Suyong. I, I, I think currently now, I feel that the ideology in many countries, including Singapore, is that more is always better, right? So that, and it never ends, right? Because there's never an upper limit to how much we can earn and how much you can spend and how much you can flaunt, right? So I, I Corporate think- Corporate profits. Yeah. 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 Taxes. So, you spend, there's tax. You spend, the corporates earn money and then uh, you, want it, you want it to come back full cycle where the corporates then reinvest much more money in trying to grow the economy. Yeah. So, and I, I hope to perhaps see a, a kind of a shift uh, from a kind of an ideology of more to an ideology of enough. Right. So in a way, we, we need to go back to, um, I mean, talk to our, I mean, our seniors, right, say, and, uh, and really, like, I mean, have a think about how we can perhaps, how we need to be more frugal in how we uh, tap on resources, right? And, and really to tell ourselves that, you know, I think let's aspire for enough, enough not only for ourselves, but enough for everybody. Yeah. And I think that is uh, better for society. I think we'll all be happier. 
and uh, and also that's good for the environment. And then we can definitely extend the runway for everyone. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, you know that this whole idea that we learn in school about the three R's, right? Reuse, reduce, recycle. That that that's all part and parcel of sustainability as well. But you know, some people say that um it does involve a lot of cost. For example, um if we were to put solar panels on top of uh, our houses, say if you stay in a landed house or, or, or say HGB were to build solar panels on top of the all the HGB roofs. So what, what do you think uh, in terms of this? Like, um, would it be very cost prohibitive in, in order to ensure a more sustainable environment and, and you know, to combat climate change on a personal and, uh, you know, on a governmental level? I, well, I just start off then. I'm, I'm sure Suyong can uh, chip in. I, I would say that uh, certain things would have to cost money, right? So, but I would say as far as solar energy is concerned, uh, the, the good thing about solar energy is that if you look at the cost of the kind of the life cycle cost of production, it's actually uh, solar and wind are actually cost competitive. In fact, it's actually cheaper to invest in solar, right? To produce a kilowatt power versus building a billion dollar natural gas power plant. So, so the cost uh, from an economic point of view uh, is, is working out. Right. But of course, in Singapore's context, um, uh, and, and the government has said, and, I, and there's definitely truth in it, which is that we are land constrained, right? Because uh, solar and, uh, needs quite a bit of land to, to deploy. So, so that will be the one physical constraint that we face. But having said that, I mean, we can look for innovative solutions. And, and also, there's been some talk about this uh, Australian company that wants to build this gigantic uh, uh, solar farm, right, in the, in uh, somewhere near Darwin, and then they'll pipe, they'll, there'll be a, a submarine cable to, to relay the electricity to us. I mean, I, I think we should look at some of these transboundary solutions. I, the nearest island from uh, Indonesia to Singapore, I think is only, what, 17 kilometers. Yeah. Lease the island for 25 years, deploy your solar panels. And Johor is actually very near to Singapore. Even nearer, yes. Plentiful land for us to lease lots of space. So this thing about land constraint is just a figment of our imagination. And how, how, how about on water, so young Like uh, say on reservoirs, because I, I read, I don't know, is it on uh, NEA or, or which website a few years ago that they mentioned they were actually exploring, you know, uh, covering our reservoirs with uh, solar panels. I have no idea how that whole plan is going now. They said that it not only is able to generate um, electricity, but you know, it kind of covers the reservoir, so um, it, it kind of lowers the rate of evaporation, you know, like, like we lose less water because Correct. there's less heat heating the water. What, what do you think? So all these solutions work, and I'm in fact also very pro the idea of uh, solar because Singapore has 365 days of sunshine, right? And our sun, sunshine hours, uh, what we, we manage at least 12 hours of sunshine as compared to some of the countries in the Northern Hemisphere who um, may have five months of winter and during winter, they have only got maybe four to five hours of sunshine. And so we, we should try to invest more into solar. But that said, today we have got too much electricity already. So why do we need to invest even more? Our production capacity versus our peak consumption on any day, we, we are only consuming about 70% at the peak of what we are able to produce. So we've got so much electricity generation capacity that it is odd that we should be saying that let's do more for um, producing electricity. So meaning then on the other hand, why did we, how did we come about having so much electricity generation capacity? So look at Jurong Island, petrochemical industry. So in addition to the three giant uh, power plants, we've got a petrochemical industry where electricity is sometimes generated as a byproduct. You need steam, so you need heat for reactions. You need steam to be fed in as, a, as an ingredient to the chemical reaction. But aside from the heat and the steam that you produce, you're able to drive a turbine that produces electricity at frictional cost. And then that leads me also to the next question, how come our electricity costs seem to be relatively expensive? Why, why aren't we letting industry use cheaper electricity so that we are a lot more efficient and profitable? 
or at least for our homes, uh, have cheaper electricity, but that, that's a discussion for another day, I guess. Right, okay, so, so Suyong, you mentioned uh, this thing about oil industry in Singapore, right, in Jurong Island, which, which of course everybody in Singapore knows that Singapore is very um, reliant on our petrochemical industry. So um, question for you is, can the economy of Singapore, which is reliant on big oil, you know, which kind of uh, creates quite a substantial amount of pollution, can Singapore be able to survive and pivot if we were to move away from this petrochemical industry, which we are so, so reliant on that uh, creates a huge amount of our GDP? I think it's the matter of will. Um, so of course, for any changes to be made, we have got to suffer a little bit of pain. Um, but do we, do we want to do it? So 30 years ago, we still have... Uh, plastic toys factories, uh, we had garment factories, and then how come we decided to take the pain of not encouraging garment manufacturing in Singapore anymore? So the pain uh, and the, we, we have got to study the benefits and, and costs. Um, and then last year when COVID hit, we realized that hey, not having a garment industry and not being on, to manufacture your own mask within our home country is, is tough. So maybe let's have a nice overall relook and realize that our over-dependence on the oil and gas industry is actually preventing us from moving forward on the sustainability uh, front. Maybe just to add, I thought another angle uh, is that I would say that even the oil and gas majors know that they have to pivot. Right, so that um, and and largely, uh, I mean, the assessment by say even the uh, international uh, energy agency and and various other uh, entities is that uh, we have either reached or will, we would be reaching peak oil quite soon, peak uh, fossil fuels, uh, so that the future ahead will be increasingly moving towards renewable energy. So the oil and gas majors they know this. So I I thought actually it's an, an opportunity since many of in fact most of them are here. They have quite uh, a lot of investments here is really to work with them to look into how we can uh, green their operations, right? I mean, maybe I give a specific example. So one of the new emerging technologies is this thing called carbon capture and storage, right? So, so ba basically, you, um, there are certain chemical processes you can um, put in place that absorbs the, the CO2 that is produced, um, say, uh, when you are doing cracking, right? So that means breaking down the, the petrochemical products into byproducts. So and then and you, you capture the CO2 and then you, you pump it deep underground. So that means you, you, you stop it from being emitted into the environment. So these are all the things that, are, uh, that can be done. And they're very expensive, these technologies, but because they're here and, and, uh, and I think it's a matter of kind of a bit of a nudging, maybe putting a bit of a carrot and stick approach and working with this, these companies, right, to kind of, because they, they know they have to pivot. So let's, let's kind of co-invest with them and look for some of these kind of solutions. Yeah. Yes. So on that point, what happens if the two giant-sized oil companies who are in Singapore decided that they are moving away from fossil fuel products much faster than uh, what they have announced? Then that would immediately uh, mean that Singapore because these two large companies who have invested in Singapore for over 100 years, if they were to move away, would our infrastructure in Jurong Island and the petrochemical industries that have been built up around their crackers, um, would, then, would we then be forced to also quickly move away? So are we going to depend on their decision or are we going to work with them to sort of make the shift together? Of course. So. Um... So therein the question comes is that is Singapore able to survive if we try to pivot away from big oil and, and say if we want to focus on um, other methods of uh, renewable energy, right? Uh, be it um, solar, wind, okay, like Singapore don't have that much wind or, or, you know, tidal energy and stuff like that. Would we be able to be a global leader and, and be able to make, uh, in a way, as much revenue as what we have in big oil? 
So what I suspect from reading the very cursory announcement about the Green Plan 2030, um, and as well as uh, looking at the budget allocations of um, $30 million for EV uh, electric vehicle charging, and th there's a huge bunch that starts with uh, billions, which is uh, that Singapore wants to get into the market of uh, green financing green bonds. So it, we certainly have sufficient talent in Singapore in our financial services market, as well as consultants like Manway, who can help companies move into green businesses. So if there were, say, a giant wind farm or a huge tidal uh, energy farm uh, being built in Indonesia, Australia, Malaysia, we could be the financiers we could arrange and we could structure the uh, public-private uh, partnership schemes. We could be the ones who help with the impact assessment. So we could still be the consultants and project managers for a lot of these green projects, plus supply the money to realize these uh, large projects. So we can still have, a, have skin in the game and make a profit out of it. Sure. Okay. So, so before you know, we move into the green plan twenty thirty, which which I was uh, talking about just now. Um, so, Young, you mentioned something about uh carbon bond and uh, the the green bond and stuff like that. So, uh, maybe Manwei, you want to shed some light onto our carbon taxes, right? Uh, do you think that the imposition of carbon taxes is a good way to force companies to think green? Okay, so currently now the carbon tax is uh five dollars per ton, right? So and then and uh and then there is a schedule to review it so that and uh, and I believe the government has mentioned that they want to raise it to about ten to fifteen dollars. Okay, so um okay, but I think to so if you ask me my 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 own view uh, is that I think uh it's it's a good thing that we have a carbon tax. So but but the amount uh, might. It needs, I think you need to ratchet it up, right? So that it, it really makes, uh, so that at least uh, the businesses that are impacted would uh, really want to shift towards uh, kind of greener uh, energy, uh, right? So, okay, so that's my first comment. And, um, and but, but the thing is that actually the, the, the idea of a carbon tax is widely accepted to be a, a effective mechanism, but but the caveat is that actually very few countries have implemented it. In fact, it's only, uh, I think off the top of my head, I think it's only Canada and, uh, uh, and I believe California, right? So I think those, and I believe that some, uh, the, the, in Europe, they have a different system. They call it a cap and trade system. So they don't have, uh, if, I, if, I'm, I, I, if I'm not wrong, I don't think Europe has implemented a carbon tax. Yeah. Um, my other comment is that, um, so currently now the carbon tax only kicks in if you are a giant emitter. So I believe the cutoff is something like 25,000 uh, tons of, uh, uh, 25,000 tons of CO2 emission. So by that cutoff, uh, so only currently only about 30 to 40 companies uh, would have to pay a carbon tax in Singapore. Uh. So I, I, I feel that um, if we want the carbon tax, I mean, if, because if you think about it, the carbon tax, it does two things. Well, one is that it changes behavior. Two is the signaling effect. So, and if you want them to be effective, I feel that the carbon tax threshold should be lowered, right? Yeah, so that at least more companies would be, would kind of be nudged along in that, in that shift. So yeah. these companies paying the carbon tax are already generally profitable to the tune of billions yes. a year. And so to them paying the carbon tax, no big deal, right? But what exactly are we doing with the carbon tax money? So if you could, for example, road tax and COE collections are supposed to be piled back by Ministry of Transport, supposed to be, to improve road systems, traffic lights and stuff, right? So if we could somehow channel carbon tax to people who are in fact already very pro-environment and practicing all the correct uh, green initiatives. And then we reward them by giving them, paying back the carbon tax to these companies that are already environmentally friendly. Then that would encourage even better behavior because other than the stick, which is the tax, you ought to have the carrot 
to be given away to people who are already doing their best for the environment. Well, since you uh, mentioned now about carrot and the stick, right? What, what do you think uh, actually works better, right? To get Singaporeans and Singapore companies to, to be more um, involved in sustainability. Do, do you think that this uh, incentivization and penalty system works? And, and maybe if it does, which works better? Does a carrot or the stick work more, you know? I, I would be asking for both both the carrot for people who default as well as uh, uh, the stick for people who default and for the carrot to be given to, to recognize those who are conscientious and are very responsible in their day-to-day -day actions. Um, are there maybe any other better methods than just to punish or to reward people? Is, is there maybe a better system that the, that the Singaporeans or the government can explore? to uh, make people more uh, socially conscious. Yeah. So and maybe I add, add to that. I, I, I think a very commonly, uh, a, a very something that's close to all our hearts, everybody talks about it, and particularly the younger crowd is uh, recycling, right? So, and then, and, uh, and very often, uh, the narrative is really centered around, oh, we need more public education. We need more public education. We, oh, people don't know where to put their things and so on. So I... I feel that coming back to Terence's point, I think we need to take a systemic approach, right? So, so basically, there is no single magic bullet, right? So, but we need a variety of things. So, as far as recycling is concerned, for instance, right, um, you need to incentivize uh, good behavior, right? Say, and um, and um, you also need to have penalties. So, uh, that's why I'm, I'm uh, one of the people who is for uh, having a mandatory charge when you go to the supermarket and you ask for bags, plastic bags, right? So in other words, and so the third element is actually regulations. Like, right, like, like for instance, in, uh, in many countries in Europe, for instance, um, you are required by law to sort your rubbish, right? So if you don't sort your rubbish and you're found out, okay, then you'll be ticketed, right? You have to pay a fine or something, right? So in Singapore currently now, uh, again, the, 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 the way we approach recycling is really a lot of, moral suasion, you know, a lot of uh, kind of nice, uh, few good videos. And so I, 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 I think that's important. I think that's, that's good, right? Because you want people to, to support it and do it willingly. But I don't think that's enough, right? So because otherwise, if you look at the current state, for instance, uh, plastics recycling, and I think NEA just released their latest report, it's still an abysmal 4%, right? So only 4% of single-use plastics are recycled in Singapore. I, I remember a carrot in my, in my younger days when I finish a bottle of soft drink and I bring that glass bottle back to the provision shop. I get back a few <laughs> cents, right? So that is carrot. Right now, we only have the stick where if I'm at a supermarket and I ask for an extra plastic bag that they want to charge me. So the stick is there. The carrots are not there. So the carbon tax is a stick. And if we can use the carbon tax not just as a, a revenue source for the government, but that the government then rechannels this tax back to encouraging good behaviour. Uh, that would make things work much better. Sure. How about upcycling? You know, like uh, if, if say we go to the beach and collect all these cans and bottles and whatnot, that, that we can repurpose them. Do you, do you think that's a very good Yeah, effort collect to from the beach, bring it to a nearest provision shop or recycling centre and collect a few cents back. So even yeah. people who are, say, jobless <laughs> might try to get some money out of uh, collecting plastic bottles, right? Better than collecting cardboard for exercise, is it? Like, you know. Ah, I think the exercise factor would also contribute a lot, yes. <laughs> okay, well, um, you know, talking about all this recycling and all this effort, right? I'm, I'm sure the, the Singapore government is actually also looking towards uh, recycling as a big initiative. And like what we mentioned just now, there's this whole thing about uh, Singapore Green Plan 2030. So uh, Singapore Green Plan 2030, actually, uh, we're looking at um, investing quite a lot uh, over the next 10 years. And, and of course, uh, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long also did mention about uh, 100 billion over 100 years. But over, over the next 10 years, you know, they want to dedicate, uh, I think, $5 billion to coastal and drainage flood protection measures. That's all part of the Singapore Green Plan, which, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are interested, it's all on uh, the internet. The government actually has 
a Singapore Green Plan website dedicated to it where you can find out a bit more. But I, I'd like to find out from our, our speakers, your thoughts on the Singapore Green Plan 2030 and, you know, are there any areas that can be beefed up on or currently maybe lack a bit of focus on which uh, we, we can really try to change? I am unsure that the Green Plan has been finalised. So while, while preparing for this discussion, um, went to visit the Ministry of Environment website and read through what was discussed in Parliament and it seems that the Green Plan has, isn't a finalised plan yet. And in fact, um, the, the planners are probably looking for ideas. Yes, yes. They, they, they do want Singaporeans to also contribute some ideas. So that I, I guess that's where you two can come in right now. Is no, you, we, yeah. In fact, we did last year, uh, he and I, we together with another two partners, uh, we submitted a, a proposal because uh, Paliba Airbase will be shifting out um, around the year 2030. Correct. And so there are calls for ideas to um, replan the entire Paliba Airbase, the runway and all. And our proposal, which didn't win. So it's not reflected in the green plan? It's, it's not, but we have proposed reforesting the entire Paliba Airbase and then um, creating a little bit, not, not very much, extra livable space uh, and workspace within a newly forested uh, patch of uh, Paliba Airbase. And on the runways, we have proposed um, wind farms as well as uh, bringing back natural environment. So we wanted Paliba Airbase to be the new green lung that would provide more oxygen and capture more carbon for Singapore. Well, I think they're trying to do something like that at Tengah also, isn't it? Like, like they want Tengah to, to be some sort of green town and stuff like that. But still, we have demolished a lot of trees. Uh, we have cut down a lot of trees in order to rebuild Tengah. And so, uh, are you really able to compensate back what you have cut down? So, it's yeah. very odd. So, maybe coming back to Terence's point, also building on what Suyong is saying. So, I, I would say that there are two items on my wish list for the, the Singapore Green Plan. So one is uh, perhaps since uh, Suyong touched on deforestation. Uh, so my number one uh, wishes item will be really for Singapore to adopt a zero deforestation goal, goal right? Because uh, I mean, quite frankly, um, I mean, we go around, I, I think generally the sense is that even you talk to say uh, planners, architects and so on, which is that uh, I, I think the sense is that I think we can, optimize our current stock of developed land, right? Without having to chop down more trees, right? So- And in addition, we have already been reclaiming two square kilometers of land for the last 60 years in a stretch, meaning we have reclaimed 120 to 130 square kilometers of land. And we, we have yet to build on a lot of them. Go, go take a look at the, the new yeah. Pulau Tekong now. Yeah, be, be, because, because I, I thought maybe uh, one an area of a bit of inconsistency in the green plan is that there's a goal to plant a million trees. Uh, but the, the plan is silent on deforestation. Uh. So I thought really, uh, ideally, we want to really have a cap, right? Say no more deforestation and over and above that, plant uh, a million trees. I, I think that's So what a, is the net increase in trees, right? Yeah, you could yeah. plant a million, but you have actually chopped down 900,000. So that's, that target is just a net increase in 100,000 trees. Yeah. And do you really want to count trees that are along our pavements? It, because that doesn't count as a, anywhere near a forest. Yeah, and, and also from an environmental point of view, I mean, it's, it's not the same, right? Say a forest, there are other co-benefits, right? Beyond, say, the carbon sequestration. I mean, it protects flora and fauna. And it's also places where that we can all enjoy, right? Okay, but then uh, maybe very quickly, I, if I can come back to the second item on my wish list, uh, which is that, um, again, if you go to the, I think it's greenplan.gov.sg, so they, they talk about the objectives, and one of them was that, um, one of the SATA objectives is that it's supposed to support our uh, commitment to the pa uh, Paris Climate Agreement, right? So, and, and but what I feel is missing in the current green plan is that there are actually no annual targets on uh, emission reductions, right? So, and um, 
okay, the government has a longer term uh, pathway, but I thought what would be useful? It's like, it's a bit like if you look at GDP, right? Every quarter, the Ministry of Trade Industry comes out to announce how we're doing on the GDP, right? So, and so likewise, right? I mean, if we think that really uh, climate uh, uh, um, security, climate change is so important, then we should have at least minimally an annual report card on how well we are doing. So that let's start measuring. The, yeah. Let's yeah. start measuring and reporting what we measure. Yeah. And it is odd for, that you mentioned that there's this new website and new organization. Yesterday I attended a sustainability webinar led by the Ministry of National Development. And the total number of organizations that supported it, and these are ministries and step boards, they are what 15 different logos all related to sustainability. I, I, I think that's a little bit over the top and coming back to being frugal and uh, not overusing resources, why do you need to create so many new organizations, printing new name cards, having new letterheads? And uh, of, course, of course, the benefit is that we are creating jobs, but we may also be creating unnecessary bureaucracy and that's what's hurting the climate. Right. So, so you think all this red tape is, is actually just slowing down our plan for a proper green plan? Could be, or it might generate a lot of noise, but little uh, real forward action. Okay. I, I, my, my perspective is a bit different because I feel that, again, kind of uh, based on my work uh, currently now as a, as a trainer and as a consultant, which is that sustainability is a vertical and a horizontal. So in the sense that there are certain things which are kind of specific to sustainability, right? Say like sustainability reporting, uh, say carbon accounting and so on. But at the same time, um, you really need all the agencies to come in, right? So, uh, and uh, in the sense that let's say even, and it's good, right? I mean, like I think even the Ministry of Defense recently they announced that they are also looking at ways to reduce their, their carbon emissions. So, so I would say, hopefully, I would say that hopefully those 15 logos is because those 15 agencies have committed to supporting uh, you know, Singapore's sustainability aspirations. Okay, so let, let me then add on with uh, what is, uh, has been happening in the built environment. So in the real estate development and construction side, there's been many um, seminars and talk over the last 10, 15 years, in fact, um, about construction waste, about construction um, being able to go more efficient such that we generate less waste and also that um, whatever we build could be a lot more sustainable and environmentally um, uh, responsible. So one of the program is, for example, the Green Mark. The Building and Construction Authority has a Green Mark Award for buildings that want to refurbish themselves or for new buildings uh, that have yet to be built. But looking at the scoring system of the green mark, it is a, a long sort of uh, list of things that sound and look good, uh, such as smart building management systems. But then you question, how do you define smart versus not smart? So while the plan, uh, the, the scheme is good in that it forces uh, people who want to be labeled as a green mark gold or green mark platinum, it forces us to think more carefully and more responsibly when we design uh, the new building. Um, it doesn't say too much about um, maybe you are throwing away five additional tons of cement that you have bought that it has uh, damaged uh, during construction because somebody messed up during the construction process or that you have over-ordered uh, ad additional two tons of uh, steel and then that has gone to waste. The other thing is that while well, we have got these nice labels for Green Mark, we didn't think about whether the building itself is easy to maintain for the next 20 to 30 years. Because for us, there's still this disposable type of mentality where anything that is after 10 years, if you want it to go on block, you merely need 80% of owners to vote for it to go on block. And a developer can come in, buy up the on block, tear down the building and create another 100 tons of waste and then rebuild the building. So 
some of these long-term maintenance and uh, sustainability issues, we should also be giving scores to, not just giving a good score to somebody who can design and build the building today. Oh, okay, sure. So um, you did mention about this whole BCA green mark. So um, for viewers who do not know, uh, there are, I think now, maybe more than 2,000 uh, buildings which actually have been awarded the BCA Green Mark. And, and that's quite a substantial number, you know. Uh, the very notable ones, you have like your uh, Park Royal Pickering, right? You can see on the outside facade, your Changi Airport Terminal 3 on the inside, one whole wall of green. And of course, places uh, like educational institutions, you know, uh, ITE, College Central, and, and all this. But um, so you mentioned the downsides of it, right? Maintenance, that, that's one of the points which you raised. So um, is it actually a lot more expensive to even build such green buildings? And, and uh, is it a lot more expensive to maintain and, and build all this kind of a green mark? I don't building. think it is more expensive to actually build, but it is that during the design process, if you could think about water and its use and whether you can salvage some wastewater and reuse the water, um, how do you take care of uh, waste management of the building? How, how might you save electricity? So during the design process, uh, understand where the sunshine is across 12 months of the year, uh, where might be rain and monsoon uh, hitting on the building and stuff. So during the design process, you are actually a lot more thoughtful and you think deeper and therefore you design a building that is a lot better and good for the environment, good for the users. But when you mention Changi Airport T3 or even Jewel at Changi, they, they can get any Green Mark Award at the beginning for the design. But going into Changi T3, I see a lot, a lot of glass. You are building a greenhouse, in fact. And so how much electricity are you generating in order to use that building in the next 20 years? And then for Jewel itself, how much water and how much electricity are you using to pump that water as well as cool the environment because the entire Jewel is a greenhouse? Yeah, so maybe just to add on, because uh, generally for most buildings in Singapore, uh, energy uh, consumption, uh, for just for air conditioning, or, or rather air conditioning contributes to uh, more than 50% of the uh, electricity consumption. Oh, that's and, a lot. Suyong, Suyong is right. And, and uh, it's just that, and architects love glass, right? I mean, they look nice, they bring in a lot of natural lighting, but from a cooling perspective, it's actually it's not a good material to use, right? So because it actually, the glass creates a greenhouse effect, right? So um, then I, I thought another, uh, okay, I have another comment regarding the green mark, which is that I think um, something to bear in mind, uh, kind of taking a step back is that uh, I, I wish we can take a more conservation mindset, right? So that, because I find, I, and I think we all know, right? I mean, uh, so many kind of beloved buildings have been put down uh, in, in years, right? So including the Red Brick National Library some years back. Now. So I, I would say that I, I would see, uh, I, I see a shift, right? Towards uh, the country being more conservation minded, but because, so why? But I think other than kind of the heritage perspective, there's also an environmental perspective, which is that actually concrete, uh, which is what we need to build buildings. It contributes to 8% of global emissions. Yeah, it's a huge, emission contributor, right? Okay, reason being that when you make concrete, you need a lot of energy, right? You have to, you have to mix all the sand, limestone, and so on. And over and above that, there's also a chemical reaction that goes on, which is that you're converting the calcium carbonate into calcium oxide. And in the process, uh, right? Okay, I'm speaking in front of a chemist here. Uh, so um, in the process, it releases CO2, right? So, so that's why... That's why ideally, from an environmental point of view, I mean, it's actually better to uh, stretch the life, the, the lifespans of existing buildings and try to repurpose them than to be too merry in tearing down and, and building and having new builds. So each year we launch about 30, this year maybe we may launch up to 50 new uh, residential projects. And whenever you have a new launch, there is a show flat that sits on an empty piece of grassland. And then after the project has sold well, maybe 18 months later, this show flat is demolished and you're generating new waste. 
what, why should we be allowing so much um, to go into a show flat? And then in addition, the construction site is going on generating additional waste. So does the BCA green mark actually take into account the fact that while your construction project may have a platinum status, but outside of this construction project, you have actually wasted another five tons of material in creating a new show flat and then subsequently tearing it down when you've sold out the project. So I'm saying that while we have got all these 15 or 20 logos of agencies that are supposed to be pro-sustainability and pro-Mother uh, Earth, um, it just doesn't seem that we have a, a well-thought-through um, love Mother Earth type of plan. Sure. Um, okay, so we, we actually we do want to get uh, a lot of questions from the ground and, and I, I do see we have quite a substantial number of questions. So um, I, I think uh, I'll just go to one last point before we actually take uh, questions from the ground. So, you know, just now you were mentioning Suyong about the uh, uh, airport being a greenhouse, right? Or, or this glass and not only airport, la, I, I mean pretty much all the buildings in, in Singapore, uh, like, like what Manwe also mentioned, for architecture, architecture design purposes, that we use a lot of glass and this require um, air conditioning or, or rather additional air conditioning uh, and uh, energy expenses. So, you know, there's this uh, talk in the past few years, right? A lot of people talking about subterranean construction. You know, they, they are talking about, oh, we want to build underground, con uh, underground storage, underground um, residential places, underground, even shopping malls. So, um, you know, your expertise is on real estate construction and, and all this. So, um, what do you think about this whole subterranean construction in Singapore? Is that a good way to go forward? Because remember, we are quite land constrained, right? So, should we go that way? Uh, I think there's no such thing as a real land constraint once you can increase plot ratio to three, four or five, right? So, looking at some of the older um, locations such as uh, Tanglin Halt, Commonwealth, um, Sterling Road, Queensway, when you tear down a, what we used to call Tzap Lao Tzu, you tear down a 10-storey HDB flat, what you have rebuilt there is 40 storeys. So why is there this concept of a land constraint? Um, and then building underground, just a, a normal condo, underground car park versus an above-ground car park, the underground car park is at least 50% more costly per square foot to build. Um, so an above ground car park might cost you up to hundred sing dollars per square foot. The underground car park for the same number of square feet would cost $150 per square foot. That sort of a number because of waterproofing and then because of the weight of the foundation plus you are good, you're probably going to be putting more things above that underground structure. So you have got to strengthen it at, at additionally. So going underground, I think only really works and makes uh, sense if we use it as an underground logistics and warehouse uh, movement system, preferably when it is driverless uh, without humans um, in those trucks. And so then you remove uh, commercial vehicle movements and you put them underground, leaving the surface transport for other commercial and passenger use. Sure, but um, in terms of energy usage, right? Because now you don't have the sun shining in, right? Because it's underground. So would it actually save more energy or actually waste it, more energy in the long run? It brings uh, additional other sets of uh, issues because now you have to make sure that there's an air extraction system as well as a, a air a pumping in air as well as pulling out uh, air, right? And then also the long-term um, waterproofing, we've seen some parts of CTE tunnels that are sort of leaking, right? So the long-term maintenance and then what happens again, the reminder of the last two days is the submarine that disappeared. What happens if you get a power outage that then prevents all this uh, airflow system from, and of course, there's the other thing that is um, disease. In the underground sort of an environment, is it a lot higher in terms of the risk of transmissions of uh, bacteria and stuff? Right, very, very good points. Yeah, I think th these are things that you know um, people don't usually think about is that uh, your air circulation underground because now you, well, you, you're underground, your air come from where? Come, come from the soil, can, cannot be, right? So 
um, that there has to be all these additional uh, safeguards in place. So, so maybe uh, Manwe, with your uh, expertise on um, you know advising all these corporations, uh, would you want to shed some light on, onto this, or maybe have any companies actually uh, come to you asking about uh, building underground or, or, or underground storage and stuff like that? Um, okay, I. I... So, so when I was uh, working, maybe just to tell a story, right? So when I was working in Sentosa, then of course, uh, I was heading the corporate planning team. Then we were always looking at out-of-the-box ideas. Huh? Then one, one of the ideas that, that my colleagues and I, uh, and okay, sorry, this was nothing official. Huh? So that we talked about was uh, whether to complement Sentosa Cove, huh? we could have Sentosa Cave, right? So, uh, but, but okay, I mean, so again, uh, so maybe that's, kind of a lighthearted thing, but, but I, I totally echo what Suyong is saying, right? So I think there are a lot of uh, uh, cost implications, a lot of uh, operational issues. And, and I guess the other thing is also really, it's also uh, maybe a psychological thing, right? I mean, how many of us would want to live in a dungeon, right? So where you have no natural light, right? So, and because I, I recall, right, I think uh, in some... Um, like I recall visiting a block in Haogang, uh, so where the shop, there was a, a bunker, I, probably it was an air raid shelter or something in the basement, and then it was rented out to a tuition center. Yeah, so, and I, I went inside, it was a very uncomfortable feeling, uh, I felt, right? So it was, I felt a bit claustrophobic. But of course, if it's something transactional, I don't mind. If I, I have to send my kid for tuition, or I have to go to the 7-Eleven down below to buy some stuff, that's okay. But Asking people to live in that kind of environment, I think that's a bit of a tough step. Yeah, yeah. and the underground logistics system, if you've got trucks that are polluting, and that's why it, it doesn't work uh, only if it is electric vehicle and probably when it is driverless, such that you minimize human activities underground, then that underground logistics and warehousing system would work. Uh. Sure. Um, okay, gentlemen, so for the, in the interest of time, right, uh, I, I think because on our webinar now, quite a number of audiences have uh, actually posed up some questions. So, so why not, uh, let me just take some questions from the ground. Okay, so first question from uh, Hang Chong. Uh, he asked, should Singapore consider axing short haul flights for real project uh, for sustainability purposes? And uh, do you guys support the HSR to KL project despite its cancellation. So, so this is talking quite a lot on you know, uh, the real project. So what do you think? I totally support the KL Singapore Express Rail. In fact, um, my first job in Singapore Airlines was as a route planner and we had wanted it um, in, even in the early 1990s. It, however, if you look at the entire project in its totality, how Malaysia see it might be um, not as favorably as how we would see it because um, in the end, uh, it might be sort of a win-win situation where Singapore wins a little bit more and Malaysia wins a little bit less. So, for example, KL to Singapore in an hour and then you reach Changi Airport and you can fly out. So meaning that Changi Airport then has the, the ability to, to pull a lot more Malaysian travelers to depart from Changi Airport rather than fly out of KLIA. So that's one sort of a loss of revenue to KLIA. Um, secondly, if um, the currencies remain uh, in balance like that, um, so say you have got a medical professional around KL area, he can work in Singapore and at 8pm he's back home having dinner with his family and his specialist income salary here uh, is way higher than what he would be getting in ringgit terms in Kuala Lumpur, right? So there might be more of a brain drain then for the Malaysian economy. So while I personally support having this uh, express train, uh, I'm not sure whether our neighbours view it as favourably as we do. Well, uh, I, I would say from a sustainable, from environmental sustainability perspective, so generally... Uh, land travel is uh, better, right, than air travel, right? So in the sense that, of course, the unit, you, if you want to have a kind of a common denominator is what they call, say, passenger kilometer, right? Say one passenger traveling one kilometer, what is the, say, the carbon emissions, right? So, and then, and, and trains are actually the most efficient mode of transport from that perspective. So, so in that sense, I'm, I'm all for it. 
Yeah. So, but of course, um, I mean, uh, but of course, I ideally we should have a kind of pan ASEAN kind of a train system, right? So where we can take a train, you no, know, not only to Malaysia but even to Bangkok for the matter. But, but of course. But of course, the, the challenge is that, I mean, there are a few countries involved, so there are all these uh, kind of uh, economic uh, issues, maybe a bit of uh, geopolitical issues that need to be resolved. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so second question uh, addressed from Alfred Hong to, okay, he's addressing to Man Wai, but his name is actually Man Wei. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, we, uh, you know, our NCMP's name is Leong Man Wai, but this is Chan Man Wei, so it's, uh, they are totally not related at all. So the question from Alfred to Manwe is, uh, what recent initiatives does your company Sustainable SG run? Do you yeah, want to share? Um, okay, so I mean, my company, uh, I mean, I, I do a variety of things. Of course, I, I uh, as uh, Terence mentioned, I teach at the, I'm an adjunct. Uh, so I teach on things like sustainable materials. I'm, I'm actually teaching a module now on leading for sustainability. So then I, uh, so, and I guess for me, I also do, uh, I would say projects that I'm interested in, say in sustainability, like I'm, I'm advising a community organization now, organization now on uh, sustainability reporting, right? So as in how they want to approach it. Uh, I, I uh, recently finished or, or at the tail end of doing a, a carbon footprint for a really interesting online content company, yeah? So, and then, and uh, then, then I guess after the exercise, the company has realized that actually they have a better sense of what's contributing to their uh, carbon footprint. Then they can do something about it. Yeah. So it's, it's quite my, I mean, my work is quite varied because I, I, I enjoy the opportunity of uh, meeting new companies, right? Because I, I have to pitch, right? So then, and very often, even, even if I don't get the job, but at least I, I, I like it that I learn something about the industry and uh, the organization's context. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Manwei. And for those of you who just joined us uh, recently and missed the initial introduction, uh, both Manwei and Su Yong here, they are adjunct lecturers at the different universities in Singapore. So um, if there's any questions that you want to ask them, please feel free. And so now we have a question from uh, Richard to uh, Su Yong. Uh, so Richard is asking about the small home unit uh, for sustainability. Um, so may maybe Suyong, you want to um, just give your insights on, on, you know, the small home unit. Okay. I, if I read the question correctly, it would be... Uh, How should we start off the initiative from small home unit for sustainability? Meaning how do we work with our family to start off on this sustainability journey? If that's the case, then I would say between parents and children, let's just learn how to um, live comfortably with enough rather than over-consume resources. So instead of buying uh, a dozen cans of canned food and then not being able to finish them up in six months, uh, why don't we buy just six cans, for example? But I could have also read the question the other way around, which is Singapore now has a proliferation of a lot of shoebox units. The Mickey Mouse houses. Mickey yeah. Mouse units, uh, studios, or even one bedrooms that are just 500 square feet. And yes, on, um, on the energy usage side, especially those units that are slightly smaller and especially because... Um, the less preferred units are those with west sun facing. And the, so the west sun facing ones, generally, the, in order to move them faster, developers would develop the smaller size units so that the absolute quantum of purchase would be lower. And so these west sun facing units, if they are studio units as well, it, it, all of them need to sort of fire up the air conditioners a lot in order to cool the unit. Whereas if you are having a 1,300 square feet unit, on one side, you may have a west sun, but uh, that side will be hot. The rest of the 1,300 square feet, uh, there will be cooler spots inside and it wouldn't take as long to um, cool down if uh, it's a hot afternoon. So yes, uh, there's a, a little bit of sort of uh, sustainability issues we face when we build so many Mickey Mouse units. 
Yeah, maybe building on uh, Suyong's earlier point about families. Uh, what, what do you do? And because I also noticed that there was a question on uh, food waste. So okay, so so um, okay. I, I was looking at the our waste national waste statistics. So apparently, on average, uh, every family we throw out about one point five kilograms of waste uh, every day, right? Of which half of this comes from food waste. Right, so so that's why I, I think and something that all families can start right, and 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 it's good it's good for the environment it's good in terms of teaching the kids it's good for the pocket which is um, please cut down on food waste right so because very often we buy more than much more than we can eat. Let's yeah. invest in larders. In my primary school days, every family in the kitchen there is a larder, and this uh, that's where your half eaten food gets left over tomorrow, my grandma would throw in an extra egg and fry them up. And then it becomes a little bit more of a rojak meal sometimes when you are putting in three or small portions of leftovers. But we, and that goes back to my earlier point about being frugal. Sure. Okay, so now moving on to the next question by Tristan. Um, I, I think it's probably addressed to both of you. How can Singapore balance between economic benefits from commercialism versus sustainability effort? So let's rewind and uh, ask ourselves, what is the definition for economic benefits? Is the economic benefit purely measured by the dollar that you earn, purely measured by this concept called GDP? Or do you want to measure your wealth and happiness in other ways? Uh, a dollar value could still be measured, but the dollar value could be uh, a lower priority. You could measure how rewarding for consuming less. So then let's measure what we are consuming today as the baseline. And if next year we can consume less, of that same, let's say, water, electricity, then everybody gets a national bonus. In that case, I think our behaviours would change drastically and we would really be uh, protecting our resources, water. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, the fact that uh, every quarter, right, we hear about the GDP uh, figures being released, it goes to show that, that the government... Uh, I mean, rightfully, things that is important, but I, I think we've also reached a stage where GDP can't be the only, uh, can't be the only thing, and certainly not. It, it, I feel uh, shouldn't be the most important thing, right? So we should really be looking at a basket of uh, indicators, uh, and and that that should that could be maybe the subject of a national conversation, right? In terms yes. of what, how we want to build Singapore for the future. So, for example, the civil service bonus is contingent on GDP growth. So why not we uh, weight it down with the civil service bonus would be GDP growth minus how much carbon uh, increase or decrease we use every year. So if as a country, we actually have reduced carbon uh, in the following year, then your GDP growth minus, minus carbon gives the civil service all a bigger bonus. So let's start bringing in other forms of measurements because economic success shouldn't be just measuring the dollar we, because we are unable to measure whether our children and grandchildren will be benefiting from what we have as a dollar today. Okay, well, um, I, I have just a personal question of, of my own. I, I Because I'm interested in uh, you know electric cars and this whole electrification, right? So, um, in, in your opinion, uh, do you think that electric cars is a good way forward? And like, you know, would you personally maybe buy a Tesla or, or say, uh, you know, whatever other car brands that are producing electric cars now, would you consider it? Sure. Okay, so I, from a life cycle perspective, uh, electric cars, uh, they would generate, they are less, they will generate less emissions, right, compared to a normal uh, petrol or diesel powered car. Okay, so but by having said that, it's not a uh, uh, it's not a perfect solution. Okay, reason being that uh, basically what happens when you drive an EV is that your tailpipe emissions get transferred to the smokestack, right? Because particularly in countries like Singapore, because 
uh, our energy, we, our electricity comes from burning natural gas. 95% of our power comes from burning natural gas, right? So we don't have a emission-free grid, right? So over and above that, there are also other forms of environmental impact. So one of which, if you think about it, Tesla, right, still uses, uh, you know, steel, is steel and lithium batteries and tires as well, right? Because what a lot of people don't realize is that tires, uh, our modern day car tires, uh, there are actually a lot of plastics in it. And in fact, uh, tire wear is a major contributor of microplastics that end up in our waterways and in the air, uh, right? So, and um, so, okay, I mean, so in other words, EVs are better than petrol and diesel powered cars, but, but they are no, by no means uh, an optimal solution. And actually we should, I feel we should still continue to encourage uh, everyone to take public transport. And if at all, I think my, my view is that why don't we make public transport free, right? So let's use all the taxes, your COE, your, your vehicle tax and so on, right? And then, and use that money make public transport free for everybody. That would totally change behavior. Okay, just to add another point about EVs. EVs, I think, have a simpler uh, transmission system and gearboxes as well. So there are fewer parts. And so overall, it should contribute some back to the environment. However, when we keep measuring economic growth and prosperity using dollars, the EVs would also reduce the total number of car mechanics needed, repair workshops that are needed, right? So maybe that's why we seem to be dragging our feet on um, using, uh, encouraging EVs. Hong Kong has been giving away free electricity to EV charging in all their commercial buildings in the last six or seven years. Uh, we have got excess electricity. We could do the same. Okay, well, um, in the interest of time, I'll just take uh, one final question from Yong Kang. So um, his question would be, you know, last year during COVID, um, it, it showed uh, sustainable, so, sorry, uh, food security issues, right? So do you think that uh, vertical farming is uh, the way to go? Does anybody want to take this last question? Again, it is how much we desire to do farming. And right now, looking at the budget allocated, looking at the schemes that are being uh, handed out, um, the rooftop parking scheme, which is a potentially nine-year-long project, I, I still do not see real urgency in dealing with this subject. It, if we really want to be sustainable to 30% or 40% of our food needs, then I would suggest that we set aside proper land, uh, prop proper long-term space on HDB car park rooftops to encourage people to start to get vegetables or even fish. I, I, I think it's important. So, But I would say I would approach it from kind of two kind of perspectives. Uh. So one is that um, I, I think the, this thing about job security, maybe we should couple it with a drive to encourage people to eat less meat, la, right? So because, because why is because generally for the same hectare of land, la, you can grow a lot more crops than you can have livestock, right? So whether chickens, cows, and so on, okay? So, uh, and that's better for health. Uh, we can squeeze more protein out of every hectare of land that we have, and it's also better for the environment, right? So that's my first suggestion. Uh, my second point will be that, I mean, it's easy, I mean, and kind of going, kind of linked to what Suyong was saying, right? I mean, because how many of us want to be farmers, right? So, but I, I thought, but I thought maybe what we need to do is to encourage people to try, right? And let's start with the schools, right? Because in a way, I mean, my, uh, my kids, so I have three kids, my youngest, she's in secondary school. And I find that maybe what's lacking in our system, in our schools is really more hands-on uh, things, uh, kind of life skills. Right? I mean, they talk about life skills in perhaps a bit more abstract terms, but- Gardening I feel that, class. Yeah, gardening, gardening class. and cooking, right? I think these are the real life skills. And, and you know what? And what's unfortunate is that at least, and the more illustrious the schools are, in fact, they don't, they, they teach, they don't teach these things at all. Right. So, and I feel that actually let's bring back gardening and cooking and make it compulsory and technical, right? 
The yes. good old days make it compulsory for all our students. In fact, I've written a piece uh, suggesting that uh, perhaps on for the 22 or 24 months of national service, every soldier needs to dedicate one month to manning a plot of uh, vegetable farm in every single camp out there. That is proper national service, right? Exactly. And during times of emergency, all of our NS men have got basic gardening skills. Fantastic idea. So, so um, just a final, final follow-up. Uh, this is based on SG Green Plan. So let me just read out uh, something that is related to, to the previous question. It's that over here, they have this uh, pointer. If I were to just read it word for word, safeguarding food security, produce 30% of our nutritional needs locally and sustainably by 2030 through developing land and sea space and skilled workers funding support and promoting R&D. So do you think that's a feasible target, right? Would, would um, producing our own food sustainably through vertical farming and all these kind of things, do you think 30% is a achievable target? Okay, so I, what I understand is that I think currently we are at 10%. So it's actually quite a big jump because, and it's also a moving target, right? Because as our population continues to grow, okay, albeit slowly, but the, the food, I mean, the, the, the amount of food that we need to put on the table will also increase, right? So uh, I think whether, okay, I think it's possible if let's say all of us apartment dwellers, uh, we have a little garden, right? So at least then, then at least, in other words, it's, it's a bit of a crop source approach, uh. Well, you have got a very large organization called the PA with lots of uh, space in community centers. Every single community center could allocate a plot. Mm. Every residence committee could also allocate plots. And let's, let's just get in. I mean, 20 years ago, being a childcare teacher was not so glamorous. But after we realized it, we have a shortage of it. We encourage by giving incentives and by giving scholarships for people who want to take the diploma programs. And suddenly now, it looks like it is glam. So people will get in. Nursing is the same story. Now, many youngsters do not mind getting into a nursing job. 30 years ago, it seems like, well, Singaporeans do not really like to do this type of job. So that perception can be changed. But do we want it or not? So, so you are suggesting that we can uh, try to propagate new age farmers. And right? yeah, let's make farming hip again. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, due to our time constraints, uh, we would have to uh, end our talk over here. However, before we end, please uh, uh, just let me give a quick introduction again, or if you want to call it an outroduction of our both, both our speakers, both uh, Manwei and Su Young over here. Uh, so for those of you who missed it, earlier, uh, in the earlier part of the talk. Uh, just uh, another brief overview about Mr. Sui Yong. He's the author of six books and I actually have his latest one with me right here. The latest one is called, okay, I, I don't know whether you can actually see it. Uh, it's called The Future of Real Estate. And um, it can be bought at Kinokuniya Times and also the popular bookstore. So um, Definitely do support it, uh, especially for uh, those of you younger viewers who are looking to enter the real estate market. This is uh, a real gem of a book. And uh, he is the CEO of International Property Advisor. And if you would like to reach out to him, you can do so on Facebook or he also has a telegram group called Ku Sui Yong Real Estate. Okay, so um, for Mr. Chan Man Wei, um, he runs Sustainable SG. I believe that you have heard this uh, name many times just now over during the talk. So Sustainable SG works with different organizations to develop and implement sustainable strategies. And something about him personally, he comes with a practitioner's creed as he was looking after um, corporate planning, uh, sustainability during his almost 10 years as a divisional director of corporate planning at Sentosa Development Corporation. And something for, um, that I think would interest all of you if you are either in a school or non-profit organization is that Mr. Chan and Sustainable SG, they provide talks that are free of charge for schools and non-profit organizations. So um, do visit his website at www.sustainablesg.net or his uh, Facebook Sustainable SG. With that, we would like to thank uh, both our speakers, Man Wei and Sui Yong. Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, as a signing off, um, 
statement, I, I'd like to ask for any feedback that any of you viewers might have regarding sustainability, you know, the, the kind of things that you feel uh, PSP or Singapore can really raise. Uh, we would like to gather your ideas, your feedback, and something in which we can also uh, push forth in Parliament on uh, through our NCMPs, Hazel and Manwai. So once again, thank you for joining us uh, today and we wish you a very pleasant day. Thank you.